Okay, I, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm uh, Beatrice, and I'm uh, uh, in practice since 15 years, and I would like to take that opportunity to uh, thank Dr. Olson to uh, accept me. You know, after being in practice, active clinic, surgery, research, and trying to <laughs> participate in an academic center, it's a good thing to be able to stop and to look what you're doing uh, and compare with what is done and how it could be done differently. And uh, thank you for to everybody who's uh, teaching me a lot this year also. Um, so today I will talk about the uh, transconjunctival uh, sutures and I would like to share with you my experience with uh, that technique. So if you would like to give your opinions throughout the talk, feel free to raise your hand. I'm ready to stop and I would like it to be a discussion and I have some cases that I will present also and if you want to give comments or anything, I will be happy to, uh, to uh, have your opinion on my cases. Um, and for those, those who uh, don't do any traps, you can see that talk, that talk as a culture, ophthalmology culture that is an uh, extra options for, uh, option for uh, hypotony and, uh, and uh, post-op traps. my disclosure. So I will start with explaining a little bit, coming back on what is hypotony, their uh, consequences. The technique of a transconjunctival uh, suture, how it has been described. Uh, I will do a little uh, review of the literature, and then I will um, show you some cases that I had, and my difficult cases and complications. And uh, I will give a little bit of the recommendation of how I have been doing that technique throughout my last uh, six years. So hypotony is described as a pressure under 6.5 millimeter of mercury. That's a statistical definition. The clinical definition would be under four because often uh, the, uh, the clinical uh, decrease of vision or things like that will happen more with a pressure around four. Sometimes we can still see it between four and six but it's more frequently under four. So there's an, um, an increase of expression regarding the production. The uh, um, diminished pressure is still nine, so uh, when there's an hypotony post-op post or for any other reason, that means that the aqueous found another way to get out than the shunt canal. So the causes are hyperfiltration post-trab, a leaking post-trab, cyclodialysis, aridocyclitis, a retinal detachment, detachment um, use of hyperosmotic agents, or a vascular occlusive uh, disease. Those are the main um, cause. And as complication of hypotony, uh, depending if it's a recent or a more chronic hypotony, we could have almost no, uh, when it starts, we can have no uh, complaint, no decreased vision, and a pressure of five with a nice vision, a nice bubble, no, uh, no leak or anything, then we just observe that patient. But when it gets more chronic basis, the vision can decrease. We can have some corneal failure, some shallow anterior chamber, choroidal detachment, a cataract, and macalopathy when it gets really instable. And some, when the macalopathy is there, then the vision is really decreased with metamorphopsia usually. And the uh, hypotony is associated with uh, fundus anomalies like macular folds, choroidal detachment, folds or thickening, and vascular tor tortuosity, papilledema. And that is all caused by an edema that is chronic behind in the uh, posterior fold. So here we have some folds and some papilledema with s fixed macular folds. Often we will think that the natural history of uh, hypotonic maculopathy, um, we know that it could resolve by itself inside the first few weeks, even if the maculopathy is, is there. But if it goes over four months, usually it, it's gonna stuck there. So we try to react before that time. And since I'm doing those transconjunctival sutures, I tend to be a little bit, bit more aggressive in the, the treatment of macular um, hypotony maculopathy. I don't wait four months as often. So
So multiple treatment does exist, uh, like injecting in the anterior chamber can help an hypot hypotony, but as you know, it won't stay for a long time. It will go away and you will have to do it again and over again. And a lot of different techniques have been described to try to stop those overfiltration post-trad, like technique to shallow the pleb with patch, uh, Simon shell, uh, compressive sutures, or to modify the pleb, like injecting, injecting blood, uh, acidic, uh, trichloracetic acid, or doing laser or cryo cryotherapy. I don't do those things anymore. Th those, those are things that I've learned in fellowship in 98, 99, and they were still trying a lot of things. Now I tend to go more faster to my transconjunctival sutures. We can also do a surgical revision. Then we have to open the conjunctival. We suture the, pla the, flat, the scleral flap using a patch or not, depending on what we see when we open the conj. It is more invasive and it's time consuming and it leads to a lot of uh, pleb scarring when we reopen everything. So the major problem in those uh, overfiltration post-trab is that we have an overfiltration, but the pleb is working well. So we're trying to find a way to save our pleb, pleb the most we can. So that technique has been described by Shirato in 2009, and his first uh, description was done with 10 cases. And inside these 10 cases, it went really well for nine over 10 cases. And he used single sutures. Uh, he used two sutures in only one of his cases. So we, I use, I do that technique at this little lamp. Um, uh, we use a suture that goes through the conjunctiva. Then I grab the uh, scroll flap and go out to the, uh, the sclera. Um, I, uh, we th this picture is upside down, but when I do it, I will, I will turn like this, and that's how I feel comfortable doing it. And we pre-treat the patient with xylo antibiotic and progating iodine. Uh, we have to identify the scleral flap because of that big over filtration. You don't know where is your scleral flap. Often you just don't see it. So I will use a gonial lens, the corner of a gonial lens, to just put my uh, conch down and try to uh, identify my, uh, the border of my scleral flap. So we tend to do the first stitch close enough to the limbus. At first I was a little bit too far and I was not able to grab the flap. So now I came back closer to the limbus to be able to grab the flap. And I use the needle spatula 91105 NU. And then the patient has uh, post-op treatment as quinolone and corticosteroid. And the patient will be seen back uh, one day post-op and depending a few weeks, a week after, usually. Um, this has, uh, is, was the second study of Shirato published in 2008 where we present 50 cases of, uh, of uh, transconjunctival suture. And his indication were poor hypotony maculopathy or a chronic um, choroidal detachment. So here we have a shallow chamber, chamber, and he seems to be putting a stitch from the scleral side and go to the uh, flap after, if I, we look the orientation of his stitch. I do the opposite, but the goal is the same, and we, we want just to put a suture to bring the scleral flap down. And most of the time, it's not leaking after that suture, and the chim anterior chamber gets deeper. This is one of my cases, and uh, what I want to show in that slide is that it's surprising, but that suture will migrate throughout the conjunctiva by itself with time, and it's not long. Inside the first week, it tends to disappear under epithelium. So it was cytal negative. But we still have complication, even if uh, in a dose uh, article described a technique that goes pretty well, uh, we can have hemorrhages, we can have uh, leaking. Sometimes those are minor leakings and we wait 24, 48 hours and it stops by the result by itself. Sometimes the leaking is severe enough that we have to add another stitch just around the hole to close that hole. And, and sometimes it could lead theoretically to blebitis and endophthalmitis. Uh, I, don't, I didn't have any cases of uh, endophthalmitis for now with my uh, transconjunctival suture. We have a hypertony post-op. Often it is desired, and we'll see later the articles that show 
how high we would expect the pressure to be or we would like the pressure to be to resolve the hypotony. But sometimes it's really excessive. And then I, trend, I tend to wait a few weeks before cutting that stitch that I just put in if I don't want the hypotony to come back. So we tolerate that kind of hyperpressure after the suture. So th this is one of my case of a my myopic uh, lady of 55 years old who, to whom I put that first, uh, fir first of all, she was a post-op of TRAB. Um, her vision post-op day one was uh, six, nine and pressure of 15. And after one month, she was holding a six, 12 plus two. I didn't wrote that plus two with a pressure of six. It started bothering me to see that pressure coming down. So um, I've been checking her and later on her vision decreased again and her pressure also. So at that time I decided to do my uh, transconjunctival suture. Um, and I had to put two sutures. After one month she ended up with a pressure of a uh, vision of six, six, nine and a uh, pressure of eight. And sometime with those post-op um, and when we, ha we do have an iPod only post-op, um, we will try to have a compromise between the best vision I can have and the best pressure I can have for that same patient. Uh, Sometimes I will tolerate a 6, 12 plus 3 if I know that it's really a bad glaucoma and I, you know, I don't want also the pressure to hold a 25 or something like that. So it's really a compromise between those two things. That's her post-op. So, um, if we look a little bit of uh, the articles that have been published on those uh, on, on this technique, Pfeiffer described in uh, described in 208 uh, 16 cases of uh, patient, and the majority of them had improvement of their pressure and visual acuity. Is post-op day one at pressure around 25, so that stitch was really <laughs> tight, and or sometimes he was using multiple stitch often. Uh, Shirato in 208. Uh, studied 56 patients, and we will we'll look at his result. The last one is a retrospective st study that we did in uh, Quebec City, uh, our glaucoma group, and it has been published in 2009. I will come back later on that last one. So Shirato showed that for in his end, um, he started with pressure around 2.9 and bring the pressure up around 7, which is not, not so high. And at the end, at three months, his pressure were good and the vision was holding also. So it seems to be a little bit of kind of a discussion, how high do we need to bring the pressure? Uh, if we look at Pfeiffer paper, he likes the pressure to be 25 in post-op one and then in, in the first month to flatten that hypotonic macropathy. In our study, we had a pressure around 15 in post-op day one. So it's kind of a mean between those two. And it, we also had a good uh, uh, improvement of vision and, and the pressure was holding at six months. And this is the uh, visual acuity in the Shirato paper, which was also an improvement of the vision. In his study, Shirato, uh, over 56 eyes, he had to remove the suture for hyperopic uh, pressure in 40, 14 cases. He needed to do a revision, needle a revi needle revision in ca four cases and surgical revision in one. So mm, the, he concludes saying that this technique is simple, non-invasive, efficient to treat mm, majority of uh, hypotonic medicalopathy or chronic choroidal detachment without major complications. And in our study, we, we looked at 35, 30 highs. And the, the main thing that we bring with that study is that we could find that in the highly myopic patient, we didn't have a so good result. The other patient were, it, there was no difference between the other groups of patient, the duration, even the duration of the hypotony, which is surprising. But for a myopic patient, those one really don't respond well. And also our study was a six month one, so we could see that uh, the pressure and the vision were, maintain were maintained at six months. Then after that paper in 2009, then I went to the academy and I uh, went to a breakfast with the expert to try to see what kind of complication do you have with that technique. But unfortunately, at that time, the expert had the, did two cases. And the other one were <laughs> at that, 
The other one at that breakfast wanted to start, but I haven't started yet. And he was recommending multiple su sutures for a rapid increase of pressure and uh, the, to do the technique in the OR. Um, I show another a little case where I sort of was not totally in agreement with the uh, expert because of, uh, you will see my cases. I have one case of trauma and I think we have to remember that when that suture is placed, if the patient gets hit in, in the eye, it will open. <laughs> it's still a point of, of um, uh, vulnerable, uh, conjunctiva is really vulnerable at that site and it's predisposed to, uh, to uh, leaking. So that patient was leaking enough that I had to put it in another stitch. This patient has been referred to me for an iPod and um, following a trab and there was a bleb leak. So I did a revision for a bleb leak. When I do a revision for a bleb leak, usually I don't necessarily put a patch on my scleral site because the problem is at the conjunctival level. So I repair the conjunctival. And in post-op, uh, he had still, he was maintaining an iPod on me, even if there was no leak anymore. So in that case, I use multiple transconjunctival sutures. I went to three, and the leaking was persisting. Uh, it was <coughs> woozing from every point, every almost every sutures that I put. And uh, it, later on, it sort of stopped leaking, but the pressure was still low. So that patient has been revised, major revision with a uh, skull patch on the trap site before closing again. And, but the thing is that when we use multiple sutures, uh, as you could think, that we, when we go back in the OR, it's sticky. We've put stitches everywhere. The eye is inflamed. It's a revision that it's much more complicated than if it's, it has been done as first. So that's the same patient. Uh, what do you see here? <laughs> That is my uh, only case of infiltrate in the side of my transconjunctival suture. And since the pressure was good, the vision was good, the eye was inflamed just here, but the patient has no pain. I just treated topically with an antibiotic and wait. And I was watching that patient close enough to be sure that nothing was going bad. And it sort of disappeared. So I thought it could be infectious, but it could be also inflammatory um, ulcer. I didn't do any um, uh, culture thing um, because it was so small and limiting. I and it went away. So now that we did many cases, we talked with uh, Dr. Um, Kastner at McGill. There's the study have been done with him also. And we, we sort of uh, made our list of indications. So we used that technique for iPod, primary hypotony after a trab or a secondary hypotony after um, uh, suture lysis. So now when I uh, cut a suture, I will wrote in the chart which suture I cut and where was it. So if I have an hypotony after, I will put back a suture exactly at that space. So maybe we do too many suture lysis. Um, we use it also for, f for a persistent major choroidal detachment or for dysesthesia sometimes. But the dysesthesia has to be really major and usually I have tried something else before. Or a close closing and uh, expansion. I haven't done that but, uh, because I don't do expansion, but my uh, colleague did once and it worked. My little pearls for that technique is we use, we work in vascularized zone. Uh, not too many nerve vessels, but it has to be vascularized. If the pleb is too thin, then we will end up having leaks. So we select our patients. It induces fibrosis, uh, 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 vascularization, and leaking. If, if we use more multiple sutures, I think that if I put two sutures and it doesn't work, then I go to the UR and I will do one suture at a time. And also uh, for the patient selection, I need a patient that is uh, able to collaborate because he has to look down and stay still while I'm doing the technique. It's short, it's fast, but I still have to put to tighten the knot. So the complication and hemorrhages, leaking, secondary transient uh, hypertony. Sometimes it's totally inefficient. It can be irritating. 
Uh, and some patients describe night pain. So we give them Tylenol and it goes away with time. What I recommend to the patient is to avoid val Valsalva or any intense activities. Avoid direct compression on the eye. Use a shield at night, especially for the first month. Antibiotic and anti-inflammatory for the first 10 days. And to be careful with his eye all the time. So many uh, ophthalmologists are afraid of that technique because they think they will make a big hole. But it's rarely the case. And it, it's really, for me, it avoids me to go back to the OR. Um, it preserves the integrity of the filtration in dread. And even if I show you some complication, it's rare. <laughs> Usually it goes pretty well. So it really made my life easier with my post-ops. The major key point is also to prevent post uh, hypothalamic maculopathy, but we cannot always prevent it. Um, so I've showed you the maculopathy, hypothalamic maculopathy, and their consequences. My technique at the Sitlam, a uh, few studies with cold result. I don't. I haven't found any studies that were just looking at complications or mainly. They often say there were no complications. Um, and I would recommend you to try it if you haven't tried it yet. And good luck. And do you have any comments or experience with that technique or complication that I haven't seen yet? Because for sure we'll see some more. <laughs> No, it's a spatula. It's a spatula needle. Is, that, is the spatula needle Tenor. hard to, to make sure that you can get nice penetration into the slurry? How hard is getting that across to the slurry that it's not going to injure the slurry? Yeah, it, but it goes pretty easily. I, I can feel it when I grab how, my how car. How much of conjunctivity do you get on both sides? I mean, is, it, is this like a millimeter, millimeter and a half, would you say, between your instruments? And the oh, more than that. Yes. Otherwise, it's not going to feed wire down through the conjunctiva. So you literally kind of crumple up the conjunctiva inside that tissue. Uh, yes, and at the meantime, the, the bleb is so big often so because... So you big bleb around in this collapsed area where the suture is pulled down. Um, it, yeah, but at the, um, even if I try to go far, I don't get so far the conj. If you remember seeing my post-op like five days, it we didn't really see the conch dragging as much as is, is so much. Is it already much. through the conch in five or five days? Is it already? Uh, five to, to seven days. It's when it feeds wire to yeah. the conch Around those days. Thank you. So I think that's what you have is a, just a lot of concern, uh, particularly about you know, getting, a, getting a hole permanently that uh, will end up with blebitis and endophthalmitis. And interesting that you say, I'm, I'm amazed you don't even see it leak at the time. Uh, probably because the, even if ten old nylon is small, probably it's Your needle big. Hole is a lot bigger than ten old nylon. Yeah, and the conge around it sort of re epithelializes probably so quickly. Right after you put the needle in, you don't see yeah, I don't see always. I can see a minor one. Those one I will observe it and see the patient another day, 20, 48 hours. And if there's a minor leak, I will see the patient every day until it resolved. Well, what I like but about this technique is you do it earlier. I think one of the big problems you have is that you get hypotony, and a, and a direct result of hypotony is that you get some problem. You're going to get some poor little excess fluid. You're going to get some effusion, some soaking in the aqueous secretion. Yes. And then when you finally solve it, then the pressure goes too high. <laughs> that's what I, I used to always remember is that we'd watch it, and we have two or three, and the next thing you know, the pressure's at 30 to 35. To that point.
mainly now after cutting a suture. Even if I tend to use, I tend to use tree stitch, even if I, I could put two, but often I will put a third one in, parallel to the lambus, close to the, just to hold it there, not to prevent that hypotony with my first or second, or second suture. Um, in our center, there's a tendency to cut a lot of suture post-op and rapidly. And all of them inside five weeks. So maybe that may, that we have maybe more. And <laughs> probably that's why I have experience with it also. I try to hold on on suture lysis, but some would do 100% of suture lysis in every case. I, I don't do that, but. Do you do this in No, I do it in yeah, because you probably you have access to it easily. My OR time is limited. At four o'clock, I have to be done. So if I already put an extra trap to do, or then I end up being packed on my OR day. So it's a good thing for me to be able to do it at the sit time. And I'm not well organized with a microscope. And uh, I could, yeah. But it's probably more comfortable for the patient, maybe. Thank you.